Okay, so we're recording. So hello, everybody. I think most people know me. I'm Meredith Holly. I'm a lawyer and life coach. And uh, in my business, we help employees stop sexual harassment and toxic work environments without quitting their jobs. And today we're talking to Faith Clark, who is, I think, one of my favorite people and does some of my favorite stuff and probably in the top, like, five of smartest people I've ever met, I would say. <laughs> so Faith, will you introduce yourself and tell my audience a little bit about you? You're so sweet. You should come with me everywhere and introduce me. I'm a really good hype girl. I'd just be like, Faith, be my person. So smart. We love her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi everybody. I'm Faith Clark. I'm an inclusion specialist and a business strategist. And I'm a mommy of three amazing maverick superhero kids um my oldest son has autism and that has really shaped my journey my perspective on everything to do with business and womanhood and life and inclusion and thinking and acting together as humans so i think that that's one of the so today we want to talk about what you do to help businesses build trusting teams and be more effective and productive through team building and and inclusion specifically but i think that what you said to me has gotten a little lost in some of the conversations that people are having who are just being confronted with race issues and that's that there are so many crossover issues that like even if you're just looking at race, people of color, black people experience. It's not just race in itself, but like for you, you've gone through this whole journey of having a son who really takes some extra attention and- Right. And and, you know, the thing that I found to be fascinating, it wasn't fascinating at the time as I was learning it. Um, So I homeschooled my son um, because I got annoyed with the Board of Ed. It's like, enough, I'll do it myself. And to do it, I needed to pull together a team of college and grad students. And I mean, I didn't need to, I could have just paid people. (laughs) But I couldn't pay people. And I I felt like if I could impart some of the stuff I knew and give people an opportunity, it would be really effective. But one of the things that I found out is that there are ways to help people think and act together. And there are ways for it to not work really well. And especially if you don't have the carrot hanging over their head of, I'm paying you large sums of money. And so the process of being committed to helping him and really believing that I could help him with other people helped me to pull together a pretty amazing group of people, have them buy in to a mission that was bigger than money and have processes that helped us to love each other, trust each other and keep moving forward in terms of the goal. Which and is still like, a yeah, I was going to say accomplish that goal of him. I mean, Really, he's, from what I understand from you, he's gone from being basically nonverbal to being able to communicate. And is, is that right? Was he at one point? Yeah, I mean, he is non-speaking is what we would say. Yeah. Um, but he communicates through typing. Right. And it was, it's been a pretty arduous journey and still is. Um, and I think there's a certain kind of focus that you need to yeah. have on a really specific goal and just not be distracted by all the other things that look like they're going wrong. Well, and then for you, I think that you talk about it as that journey being arduous, but also during that time, you're like getting a PhD from, where'd you get your PhD from? Or have you completed your- I'm still trying to get, no, I'm not trying. I'm wrapping up the PhD now. But yeah, because I, coming out of that homeschooling journey, I started a business basically to train caregivers for other families. And when I was doing the business, I realized I'm going to research anyway. May as well get some letters behind my name for it. Yeah. So I started the PhD. So I'm homeschooling. Just, you know, I'm on running a business and then I'm doing the PhD. And that was at, that's at Columbia, is that right? Or is... I did my master's at yeah. Columbia. I'm doing the PhD at Grand Canyon University. Okay. So I have a okay. master's in computer engineering. In yeah. prior <laughs> life, I was an analyst. Just on the side while you're <laughs> raising a child with autism, like... Yeah. And then starting multiple successful businesses, you might as well get your PhD. So awesome. That's so awesome. Yeah. I found myself excited by the people side of things moving from engineering. And so psychology felt like it made sense to me. 
that the systems that I worked with outside of people, now these systems are between people and within people. And so the nerd girl kind of kicked. <laughs> so like, awesome. I love funny. it. Yeah. And so now you are primarily working with business executives. Is that right? To help them with their team building and their efficiency and, and inclusion issues. So startups and new ventures and the new venture is just anybody who hasn't yet fully resolved either market awareness or internal capacity, which is most people. And so yeah. Just a minute. And so when um, I work with them, I help them to clarify the whole, let's make sure we're offering what people want and let's make sure we have the capacity to deliver it when we know that this is what people need to do. And invariably that means getting people to think and act together. Um, right. And the, the, the value of having those conversations early, because in the case of a startup, business processes, culture, and those things are not yet fully developed. And the actual team on the ground have to be really agile, very adaptable. Corporate culture is just evolving. External context is changing because they're constantly pivoting to manage the needs of the market. And so there's a certain kind of person, a certain kind of way to work together that's needed. And so I think that that's a really interesting point because I think that that space, and I'm at this space in my business of really having a homogenous workforce, like literally our, one of our beloved staff members left and she is 26 and her being 26 was the only variety that I think existed. Like I have, there's three, there's four of us and we're, we're all white women who are the same age. So that's how much. Oh. Homog homogene homogeneity, homogeneity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> has infected my brain, right? And the way that, and I'm super aware of it right now, but I think it's really easy then to start creating structures and processes that serve ongoing sameness yeah. and not diversity. Absolutely. And I think the thing, you know, the additional caution as we build those structures, you know, especially if we're not aware of it, those structures that serve sameness also only serve a very small portion of the existing people because right. there's a way that we've narrowed down the similarity between you and your other two people. Right. And, and it really is just a sliver of who you are and who they are, that small intersection. And so there is this non-inclusion even of the same people that we're doing that you're not, you're not yet even maximizing the people you have right right and it's so it's fascinating when we learn to be really really good at exposing difference and really good at wanting the conflict and the tension and really good at navigating the boundaries of that difference then we're prepared to be truly inclusive right then and it won't matter right so then what we run into a lot is employees who are at the tail end of that not happening in businesses and at the expense and it, companies at the expensive side of not having built those processes and they're losing employees and they're not even necessarily aware of it because the employees yeah. are working with us to try yeah. to overcome these environments but they're afraid to even tell the employer right so if people can work with you ahead of time and, and what I see is often leadership has a hard time admitting even yeah. the sameness that's enforced in the culture. And we have this sort of fear of the difference, do you think? I think that, you know, we don't, we've made it bad. Yeah. You know, the, the whole, I want to be um cool i know that diversity is the thing and it's like we have all this language and i want to be that person and it really challenges our self-image to to even admit that any such thing exists and so and the, the weird thing about bias is that you can't see it right so you you have to trust somebody else when they right. say hey there's a thing here it's happened right. five times um and it's trust is a big deal because you, you have, have to look for it and establish a space where people can say that, where you can yeah. even hear it, right? But the, that they're able to come to you and say that if you're the team leader, and then for you to acknowledge that you might, it might not even resonate with you. It, it, it will be just like, what, what are you saying? Um, and to be willing to say, hmm, implicit bias is that way. I, I have yeah. to assume 
that it might be there. Let me put some things in place until, you know, there's, there comes a point when the invisible becomes visible. And then you're like, was this hair all along? <laughs> You know, it's like, yes, that's what we've been saying. Yeah. It's here, right? Yeah. And so we have to build those teams with really high levels of trust mm -hmm. so that when we include others, they can tell us, hey, these are the ways that we, we don't feel like we belong. And so you were giving me a couple of examples before we talked of people that you've worked with sort of through that process who have had some success. Do you want to speak a little bit to like when is a good time for people to start working with you, what you've seen be successful, things like that? So I've noticed that there are, I call it the high performing team. Cause I think, you know, Meredith, you and I've talked about this, that a truly inclusive team um, it has all of the infrastructure to be a high performing team. And lots of the high performing teams that we see, either they're already inclusive or they're just kind of, all exactly the same people, right? Right. And so I do believe that people need to start working on this at the very, very beginning. Right. But I think teams will go through stages of their development. And so I, in my mind, I have four stages that a team goes through to the point where they have what I call, you know, this collective intuition. They, they kind of think and act together in rhythm, sometimes even without words, right? Right. And at the very beginning, when the team is just forming, part of what we'd want to do is to help that team fully disclose to each other, both in terms of <laughs> my son is going to speak to us. Yes, you could have dinner. Oh, I think that this is such a good example, though, right? Because I think that, and of what we're talking about, about there being different factors that we have to consider, because I think we create this vision of what it means to be a business owner, right? Yeah. That we don't even intend to exclude moms, for example, or to, yep. but we have to intentionally say, this is part of business for a kid to come and say, and ask you yeah. a question, right? <laughs> no, I think it's real. Like I, I, think, I work with my puppy every day and every once in a while she loses it. Right. But my clients, also have puppies like they and that is a more important alignment of us than whether they're male or female whether what skin color they have is that we have this space of humanity and we're trying to solve problems and yeah. the puppy is not a problem the child not is not a problem yep. Yep, it's yep. what we're working on anyway <laughs> no i would i mean i the this is part of why i've structured my business the way it is because yeah. i do have a child with autism and when i work with business leaders who also have kids with special needs, it's a privilege to be able to say, no, honestly, that's not a big deal. That's part of the process. This is, this is just, yeah, he's having a tantrum. Go deal with that. It's fine. I'll be here in 10 minutes. Come right. Here. You know, it's just right. life. And we are part of business who, as who we are, right? Yes. Not trying to conform to a white male standard with a suburban home yes. with a wife who's managing children right yeah. there's a bunch of different ways to be human yeah and all of these ways create amazing opportunities and it and looks like raising a child with autism while you do your phd not waiting to do your phd until your life looks like some kind of we'd be, we'd be like five lifetimes <laughs> right well, right. I mean, and it's not relevant to whether you can do a PhD, right? Like you get to show up as you with all of the brilliance that you have and apply that brilliance in two places, right? Like that's so, I don't know. I think it's so interesting. Anyway, you were talking Thank about your- Wait, what were we saying? Yeah. So you, I think at the very, yeah, I think at the very beginning, the big issue there is full disclosure. So for example, I had a conversation with a team leader and as I was discussing with them what they needed, um, it hit me. I listened to the conversation around three independent contractors and being a team has nothing to do with them, whether people are employees, whether you're paying them or not, nothing, right? Mm -hmm. But these were three independent contractors working with this team leader, with this um, business owner on a project. And as I listened, I realized this is not yet a team. Um, and so some of what um, they were craving, they were craving, they had expectations for a team without having initiated the team. And so activities that help a team know they're a team, you know, when we went to college, there were these initiations. Teams need to know we've signed on to a thing. 
and so we signed true. our name. <laughs> it's so easy to not do also as a leader. I think that as business owners, we're like, I hired these people, go do your work. Yep. And we create this thing where they're relating to us, right? Yes. But team is the collective. Yes. Right. And so they're leading to us because everyone's checking in with us every 15 minutes. Right. 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 Instead of with each other. Right. So then that's definitely, that's not, that's a good symptom of when it's not team. When yeah. you are the conduit for all of the interactions, right. that's not team. And so you, um, yeah, that's a fast way to burn out. <laughs> It's very upsetting. Because it's not like having support. It's not like having team members. It's like having to duplicate yourself 5,000 times right. to micromanage all of the processes everybody else is doing. But I think that there is that step of getting people to make mistakes mm -hmm. and to use their own brains to solve problems mm -hmm. and to rely on each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's so and to allow that like those interactions, they can't be scripted. They have to be built in that process of figuring it out. It's like you're, you're modeling problem solving and then you're allowing problem solving. And in that, the team is building this collective knowledge, right? Yeah. And yeah. so how we, speaking of inclusion, how we handle that, that happens in the next phase where, okay, fine, they've signed on and they now have to figure out the mechanics of working together. And that's where the implicit bias stuff, and well, it shows up all throughout the team's life cycle. But right there is where we have to be super explicit about calling things out, about modeling certain ways of being, about, you know, if somebody says something to somebody that sounds off, to say, hey, you know, in our team, it's, it's a place where you're making culture explicit. And, um, and to allow ourselves to be called out in moments where like this is this is a thing because at that point it's all artificial it's like when we're learning to drive or we're kind of and so everybody gets to be in that place right and i think when we bring new team members on it's mechanical with them but the team that understands it they're modeling it but they have to model these ways of allowing difference so this questioning this curiosity this non-judgment um this this checking for people who are on the fringes and pulling them in, not saying um, if you wanted to, you would, <laughs> rubbish, uh, but instead saying, hmm, right. Carl doesn't speak a lot, how come? You know, and then just kind of what's going on there and pulling in. That's fascinating. I was talking to a friend who works for a big corporation and she said that they do these team building activities and she's always, she's white and she's always taken like an initiative stance and not wanted to force the people of color in the group who don't, they, they're at satellite offices. The, the people, of, there are two people of color in her like small group and they're at satellite. So she has been like, oh, I don't want them to feel called out. So I'm going to take the lead. And then one day she was like, I think I'm taking up a lot of space and maybe I'll just be quiet and see if they, and make space if they want to. And like the two people of color totally stepped in and took over and did. And she was like, I see what I did there. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Really, really noticing. It's a really, I feel that we, we get an autopilot in the workspaces these notions that we have of efficiency, getting it all done. There's some things that being a parent teaches and then being a parent of a child with special needs that often modeling and encouraging and all this stuff doesn't feel like the most efficient way. Honestly, right, if I could do it myself. Right. But that's not the long-term goal because we, we know. You, you can't. Can, you you really can do it yourself for 10 people. You okay. can't do it yourself for 100 people. You cannot scale that way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And our business goals are not going to be met that way. And the so, other interesting thing I found is that I have to model when I make mistakes to mm -hmm. let our culture be comfortable with mistakes and learning so that right. people, and we have a saying, I don't know if this is like a good public saying, but we have a saying in our business that no babies are going to die like, is this a problem where babies are going to die? If so, freak out. If not, yes, then I freak out. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. No babies are dying because it is like our measurement of like, do you need to cry in your pillow right now or not? And it just isn't 
most of the time. See that, right? And I think that's a good um, like framework for some of the yeah. inclusion work right now. Because clients will say to me, um, I want to get this right. Yeah. And it's all so well-meaning. I know. <laughs> I, and it's so uncomfortable to get it wrong the whole time. It, it's like we're not going to get it right. And action is what creates clarity. And it's like each step is a step away from a time when you got it wrong. But it's and how so much more important. can we get it wrong towards yes, the action? Towards the goal that we're going. Yeah. You know, let's let's walk imperfectly forward. And I and, think that so, we have this inflated idea that our action, like both inflated and deflated idea of our impact, like like owning that our actions can have unintended impact I think is important but then once we own it it's not like our impact is <laughs> earthquake need, like right? people are doing okay even though yes. we're having terrible impact they're surviving despite us so right right and we do have the space no more dinner it's all done sorry we do have the space to learn and grow and I think have good intentions along the way and yeah. I think sometimes that's part of the struggle that we think I feel like intentions matter more I mean yes technique get be good at what you do and keep getting better at what you do right but have good intentions that you can fix up front and right. as soon as you notice an intention is out of place adjust it right <laughs> just you know be right yeah. right because we are learning and it's yeah, it is a process. I, so you've talked to me about people that you've worked with who are like women of color in big uh, corporate settings. And also it sounded in the past to me like you're willing to work with white businesses who are trying to do this process of making mistakes and getting better. And is that? Yeah. yeah so um, I... The woman of color I was thinking about was a friend and she worked in diversity and inclusion. And it was just interesting to be like a fly in the wall, listening to the conversations. Um, and the reality in many workspaces, which is I think why we have to do this work, is that our bias impacts how we see performance. Mm -hmm. And so the performance reviews, though they seemed to be objective, they were not. And they can't be. They cannot be, you know, but we have these notions that numbers make them objective, right? right. And it's not. It's just foolish. Um, and so it, it was sad to see how not only is it that the numbers are not objective, but we choose what we measure to yeah. create the stories we want to create about our company. And what's normal. Really, yes. Yeah. And, and at the same time, people don't feel like they belong. I think fundamentally, if people don't feel like they belong, mm -hmm. then it's not working. Yeah. And so part of what I like to help people think about is how do we notice the bias when it comes to evaluating people's performance? Yeah. And how do we think this through? And how do we have checks and balances so that we can hear if we're having a, a bias? You know, how do we evaluate based on that? And it's a case-by-case -case situation. So that was what that corporate client, um, friend Help me. You know, I'm working with a startup, and what we're trying to do is put the processes in place at the very beginning. So some of these processes for this startup, the challenge that I'm offering to them is their marketing. Because although they want to attract a diverse C-suite at top level um, a company, um, a comp top level employees, um, the people of color that they want don't trust them. I mean, they haven't, the people haven't told them that I'm telling them. Right. Like, right. Like they're, right. they're, um, at the they very beginning, yeah, they, they don't believe that you really want to create this environment. And so marketing is one of the important ways just at the start to figure out, not just to, I don't want to say lie, like people are lying with their marketing, but not just to, drop in images of people of color and black right people. and lip service right right like not just lip but service. to honestly yeah. intend to serve a diverse population right and that means having people tell you what it will look like to attract this diverse population of clients and that your marketing is then what your employee your potential employee pool will look at will see so, yeah 
And then that's part of building that initial trust that we're talking about. And yeah. getting to that space of not just wanting to look like you have a diverse workforce, but actually to want to have a diverse workforce, which I think um, it, one of the pieces of information I was hearing last week was that, I, and I think you were speaking to this, is that um, if you have a homogenous team and you use best practices, they'll be very successful. If you have a diverse team and you use best practices and nothing else, they won't be successful because you have to create that inclusive step. But once you create that inclusion and that trust, like you're talking about, they will be exponentially more successful than the homogenous team, which I think is the importance of doing this work. Yeah. yeah and I think people think that diversity is the key thing. And right. I, yes, it is, it is, but it, diversity right. still is like all the different types of food on my counter. It's not a stew. <laughs> until we help the things to work together and so yeah. it is my party analogy you get everybody at a party but then people aren't dancing yeah you know, figuring out these processes that have people being able to really deeply and exchange and engage so that the collective knowledge of the team moving on to that stage where people can almost intuitively think and act that yeah. collective knowledge is way more then one plus one is two. It's like one plus one is 20. And, but if yeah. you're one and you're one are two different ones, you have a way more advantage. It's like you have perspective to the wazoo. Right. And you see and understand you can pivot in the market. You're, you're right. not startled by the stuff that happens because you have this, this rich collective repository of knowledge built into your people. Right, right. So, it's, one of the thoughts that I've had is a lot of the marketing information I feel like out there is about narrowing your niche market, targeting your niche market. And I think it's really interesting when people choose characteristics in their business for their niche market that are not relevant to the actual service that they're providing. So we had to do this change in my uh, office when I kind of felt convicted about it. Initially, I used to say that we help women stop sexual harassment, but we had so many men and people who identify as non-binary and, and gender fluid and all these different genders coming to us with these same problems that I, I realized woman is not a, a important component of the market that I serve. It really is employees who are experiencing this of all genders. And I think that this can happen with employees too and with teams is when a leader, you get this idea of what it means to be effective in a certain role and then you add on these characteristics that are just not related. So I saw that in a school that I'm working with and this wasn't the team, but it was helping the team work through a process that they did with students. And they're really, really big on inclusion um, as part of the, the, pro the way the school is run, including the kids, mm -hmm. right? all different, uh, twice exceptional, multiple um, differences with the kids. Mm -hmm. And as it's just something simple like write a paper versus express what you know, and just to be able to notice like, hmm, why do we think somebody should write? Right. And, I, and as I thought about it, I was like, how many ways have we been defining performance characteristics based on preferences versus based on what's needed? For yeah. The work? This, yeah. This knowledge needs to be expressed. It doesn't have to be written. It, you know, and I think that that's part of what happens in defining these roles um, in the workplace. Which is why I think it's so important. And, and this is sort of something that we've talked about. Like I, a lot of people who follow me are business owners in Oregon and Oregon is like a vastly white space. And this is one of the reasons that I think it is so important, not just to try to do the diversity inclusion work, but actually to bring in people like yourself who have had these experiences, specifically with also ableism as an added barrier, right? Um, to have this other perspective that we can't even see, right? Like, I don't think it's just about opening yourself up to awareness. I think it's about actually bringing people in who are gonna show you perspectives that you can't be aware of. <laughs> it's 
you, you there's just stuff that you would not see and yeah. I'm, I'm grateful for my varied background because I've sat on the fringes of multiple groups just yeah. because of how I identify and so I was watching a friend of mine recently who in, is in Jamaica and it works with um, in the educational space but with the kids that are really poor in rural areas and as she was describing she was in tears describing a call to a family member telling them about a scholarship for this young man and saying okay so the scholarship means that he's going to have these extra supports for in in school he needs a device you know we're going to send the device and the grandmother basically says you have to text his aunt because i'm not a reading person and my friend just in that moment it hadn't occurred to her and i think it's so important that we surround ourselves with a whole range of yeah. people of different life experiences so what you can hear i could have assumed that this kid from a non-reading person would not have been available for this thing but grandma had already figured out she's a non-reading person auntie can read so text aunt aunt is gonna walk down and talk to her and she's gonna put right. him on the and these are it we can't we can't make this up in our brains right barriers that you just don't realize are barriers that are unrelated to getting the services and solutions that people have used for these barriers because part of how we need to help people both on the job and our clients if we know the way they're solving the problem that they right. deal with they have barriers that we cannot understand you people can't know what being a parent of a child with autism is like right um, but they can see watch what i'm dealing with yes. see how i'm solving my own problem and then join me and i think within the workplace we have to be willing to kind of pay attention to how our diverse workforce is working on solving the problem that they have rather than treating the characteristic or the the barrier as a terminal barrier like it just is a challenge that is going to lead to greater creativity in the workspace I mean, yeah. it is the proverbial printer in the middle of the room getting in the walkway that you don't you think that's where the printers are supposed to be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> until somebody with whatever situation limited peripheral whatever yeah it's like maybe we can just push the printer to the, the printer yeah <laughs> So true. So you were telling me that you have these four phases that people can sort of diagnose where they are in this uh, process of team building and that you're willing to share those four phases and how people can diagnose themselves with my audience. Is that right? Yes, I have an assessment for inclusive team development. And when I say inclusive team development, assume there is the peak performing team, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, inclusion isn't like the bow we put on it to make teams pretty. But I'm saying that you want a team that really is going to be productive. You, if and, you're going to have diversity, you want to have inclusion so that you actually utilize the diversity. The talent that you have, right? <laughs> and so there are these four phases and I have a few questions in each phase that, you know, will help you see where you need to place attention and what i'll just hint i'll give a, a, a give away one of the answers trailer, yeah yeah give away one of the answers you always have to work on trust it yeah. just looks different in all the phases but you always have to be working on people being willing to be vulnerable with each other yeah. or you know all of the phases but yeah i'm happy to either hop on the phone if somebody is in that stage where they're they know there's a challenge with the team yeah. then it might be easier to diagnose quickly on the phone. Yeah. But I'm, I'm willing to share the document as well. And you can just kind of read through the questions and answer for yourself and get a sense of where your team is at. And what's the best way for people to get that from you? Unfortunately, I spend a lot of time on Facebook. So, so if you're seeing this by Facebook, just comment and I'll reach out or email me faith at melodyofautism.com. Okay, so melodyofautism.com. Faith at melodyofautism.com. Awesome. And then also you have a book. We didn't talk about your book really because your book is kind of I, I was reading your book and I was like, yep, this just has all of the like I I was a little bit like, stop bragging about how smart you are. <laughs> like, 
it's just like, I'm a mom with a child who has autism and this is really hard, but then I did this like amazing thing. I didn't sleep ever, but it's so awesome. I mean, what you, what you're going to do, right? You just, it's, it's embracing a friend of mine said it to me this way, or maybe I watched it on a show. I don't know. I'm going to credit it to my friend. You have to play the hand you have. You yeah. have to play the hand you dealt. And yeah. so I, I was like, I, this is my hand. What am I going to do? But I, in my book, it was really me just saying, this has to help someone. I'm going to write yeah. this out. <laughs> I think your book is amazing. So your book is Parenting Like a Ninja, and it's at melodyofautism.com. It's, it's at faithclark.com as well, and it's at parentinglikeaninja.com. Oh, um, so and everywhere. Amazon. <laughs> and that's Clark, C-L-A-R-K-E, right? Yes. Yeah. And then um, I feel like what you're doing now is like build teams like a ninja. You're like, you're <laughs> I like, should write that book, right? <laughs> you're like like uh, playing the card, the hand you're a dealt like a ninja. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's and so you know, the thing with the book for me was that the productivity tips that I talked to moms about uh, leveled up are the same tips that I talked yeah. to teams about. Totally. Because basically we have to synergize yeah. our energy to get stuff done. And also you talk about like not eliminate the human factor. I yes. feel like is the other, like use the human factor to the advantage of whatever problem you're solving. Not... The human factor is the it factor. Yeah. It absolutely is, is the way. So I mean, one of the tips that I tend to give team leaders is figure out what your team is craving mm -hmm. and build your workflow and your strategic, your team strategy around team member cravings if people are satisfying their cravings it generates energy like nobody's business and the team so will awesome. be able to be more productive like they'll be energized at work so awesome i love it awesome cool well thank you for talking to me so people can email you or comment on any where we post this um right. and if they email me i'll just send them to you uh to get that diagnostic of where their teams are so that's so fun. I really, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you feel like is important for people to know? Um, well, you know, the only thing I would say is that um, neurodiversity has really taught me a lot. Being willing to see that the fact that somebody's way in the world is different from mine, that's what autism has taught me, um, doesn't mean anything about their thoughts, um, their capacity, yeah. nothing at all. And we make these assumptions around quote unquote biology, around functioning, whether it's yeah. able to or anything else. And when my son started typing and I would read his thoughts, it was as if I was being introduced to a whole different person because my structure of who he was was interpreted solely through my own eyes. And when he introduced himself and his thoughts, I was like, who is this kid? It was humbling. I think if we would challenge our assumptions about people and really interrogate our own assumptions, it's amazing what we could find. That's so, so beautiful. And I think that it's really profound too, because I think that is how we become able to show up in the workplace as ourselves and then embrace other people showing up and using their full energy to create what we're going to create. That's so awesome. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking and we'll probably be back and we've done one or two of these already. So we'll probably see you again. <laughs> More to come. Yes. All right. I'm going to stop.